Fellowship Baptist Church. It's good to be here this morning. It's good to see all of your smiling faces. Hey, if you're a guest here this morning, we want to welcome you. You're our special guest of honor. Don't forget about tithes and offerings at the plate by the front door. Other than that, i got a few brief announcements for you, and then we're going to jump right in and turn it over to the band. Um, finance meeting tonight. If you're on the finance meeting, or I'm um, sorry, on the finance team, you need to be here tonight at 5 o'clock. That's prior to our business meeting. If you're a member, we have a business meeting tonight at 6 o'clock, so make sure you are here. But again, the finance team will be meeting for about an hour before that. Yes, sir. And we jump to it at the service this morning. Quick meeting for building and grounds. Okay. Building and grounds will be meeting directly after morning service as well. How about we'll say up here in this corner? Does that work for you? So if you're on building and grounds, meet up here in this corner. Uh, again, business meeting tonight. Uh, men's bowling. We're going to be bowling this this Thursday. Uh, apparently at 6.30. So if you are interested in going bowling, I think we're going to try to get some pizza, some chicken wings, and go bowling. Come see me by the end of the day today. Shoot me a text, call me, whatever. Come see me. I need to have a head count. That way I can make reservations at the bowling alley. So make sure you see me by 6.30. Or I'm sorry, by the end of the day. I looked down and saw 6.30. That's the bowling. <laughs> Come see me uh, if you're going to want to go bowling. Then we got a rain day coming up. That's on September 11th. Make sure you see for that and then after is the float trip. The next thing I want to talk to you about real quick is, is Facebook. So if you have your phone, I want you to pull your phone out real quick. I don't want you pulling your phone out during the service. Obviously, I want you to pull your phone out right now. So as I was looking at our, our Facebook traffic, something stood out to me and it was the shares and I'm guilty as well, so I'm not saying this is all on me, this is all on me as well. The amount of shares we're having on our, on our feed directly impacts how many people are seeing this message. So when we get around 10 shares, we're getting anywhere from five to 600 views. And that's a lot of views, that's a lot of traffic on Facebook. When we get two shares, we're getting about 100 views. So pull out your phones, go to our Facebook site, we should be live currently, hit that share button, share Facebook, and let's get the gospel message out to the world, amen? amen. All right, hit that share button, and then I'm gonna pray for it. And then I believe Mason's going to step up, and he's going to lead us this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you this morning. We are thankful to be in your house again. Lord God, we're thankful to be here in your house with other believers who have come here to worship and praise you, Father, our Lord, our God, our Savior, our King, our Redeemer. Lord, as we move into this time of worship, I pray that I pray that we would be able to lift our voices to you and that you would hear our voice this morning and it would bring pleasure to your ears. And then, Father, I pray that as we enter into a time of, of studying your word, as we open your text, I pray that you would speak through me this morning. Father, I pray that you would set distractions aside for not only myself, but every member here this morning. I pray that you would use me as your mouthpiece, as your vessel this morning, that you would speak to your people, and Lord, that the message would be received in the way that it needs to be. Father, and above all else, I ask that your will would be done this morning, that you would be honored and you would be satisfied with this service this morning. So again, Father, we give you this time. We love you. We thank you. We praise you this morning. And it's in the name above every other name that we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Um, so sometimes you have a little um, things that come up that have to be <laughs> dealt with. So uh, the way that we prepared and got ready for our worship service this morning, um, it's not how it's going to go today. So <laughs> we are going to uh, keep on in our worship service um, and continue on with uh, what the Lord is doing through song and through our lesson today. So. We are going to change it up and uh, turn your eyes on the
Amen. Guys, we've started a, somewhat of a new tradition around here uh, in the last little bit where we, we break now into a corporate prayer time, which we've always done, but we are encouraging altar prayer. We're encouraging altar prayer. Um, guys, when you look in Scripture, powerful things start with prayer at the altar of God. Powerful things happen. Brother Ray and I were having this conversation a couple of weeks ago. If you, if you map back every great revival in the history of Judaism or the history of Christianity, every great revival that we see, we can trace back to one prayer from one person. Every one. Every one of them. And I would just tell you this morning, guys, look at the world. Revival is needed. Amen. Revival is needed. What does revival mean? Well, you've got to read and you've got to buy. Buy is from the Latin viva, which means life, and re meaning to do again. So we need to come back to life. The church in the world needs to come back to life. Amen. It needs to be restored. And we know that the path forward is one righteous person pouring their heart out before God and asking for it. And that is going to spark it. It might be my prayer, it might be your prayer, it might be somebody in India. I don't know. But what I do know for sure is that if it's my turn to pray the prayer that God uses to spark a revival, I don't want to miss that opportunity. Amen. There you go. So we're going to open up the altar here and back there. And we're going to pray. And we're going to pray for revival. We're going to pray that God would start revival here. Which if you're still praying for it to happen, that means you're behind the curve. Because if you haven't been paying attention, revival is afoot in this place. We are seeing lost souls coming to know Christ. We are seeing people rededicate their lives. We are seeing, we are seeing healing. We are seeing hope. And I hope that you are a part of it. So as they start to play behind me. I'm going to open up and invite you guys to come down here and pray with me. You can use the altar in the back, or you can use this time here. And I'm going to lead us, but would you come? Father, we are so thankful for this day. God, we are thankful to be a part of what you have going on. God, we pray that as you continue your work, you would continue to use us in a deeper and more meaningful way. God, as I look at the world around us, I recognize that there are a lot of people living in fear. And God, there are some scary things. There are some scary things. But I know that your word tells us that you have not given us a spirit of fear. So help us to recognize that if we see a spirit of fear in our life or in the life of others, we should recognize immediately that that is not your spirit. Because that's not the way that you work. So God, we ask that you would restore this place to life, God. Let us spark, start here, that ignites the fire of revival across the United States and across the world. God, we pray. We pray with boldness because we know that your word tells us. Your word tells us that you are capable of doing exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or even imagine. So, God, we are asking for revival. And we are believing that you can bring it. God, it won't be anything that we have done. It will all be things that you have done. But, God, we pray that you use us in it. Use the things that we say and do to speak to the hearts and lives of people around us. God, we pray that when you send your son for the second time, that we would be a place that is found ready, that we would be a place that is found in right relationship with you, God. We pray that you use us as your hands and your feet. 
be, to reach the world around us, to go to places that are further away from us. God, help us realize that the Great Commission is a commandment to each of us. It wasn't something that you just said. It was something that you expected and you continue to expect. You expect us to go into our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, God. So we pray that you bring that about in a very real way in the life of this church. God, help us to be people that don't go on missions and return from missions. Help us to be people that stay on mission. Understanding. Understanding that our mission is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who don't have it. To spread hope and healing and love. God, we pray that you give us the strength and the boldness to do our part. And we know that you will do your part. God, we pray that you would empower our work. And God, we pray that you would lead our steps and guide us all the way. Christ's name, we pray all of these
to be a part of this church and to be a part of your kingdom. God, we understand that the work you are doing is bigger than us. It's bigger than this place. We understand that you have a vision that is much broader than ours is capable of. You have a timeline that we don't always understand. But God, we do believe. We believe that you are working. And we believe that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. God, let us be that. Let us be people so we can be set up. That we love the Lord and that we are called according to your purpose. God, we read scripture and we know. We know that in accordance with it, we are all in fact called. Let us be one to you. God, we pray now that as the teaching hour has landed upon us, God, we pray that you would move us in a powerful way. You're right. Let us speak the truth of your word boldly. God, we ask that we ask that you bring it about that the words that we hear today would be the words that you have for us. And we pray that you will find us an eager and ready audience to receive. In Christ's name, we pray this. Stand your Bible, please, this morning. Go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as we continue our study through the book of 1 Thessalonians. I just want to say thank you to the band this morning, a special thank you to Mason. Sometimes things happen and um, things don't go off quite as planned and Mason stepped in and took care of business. I want to say thank you and the band did a great job, really appreciate that. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 16, 17, and 18 this morning. We're going to look at three verses. If you've been present over the last few weeks, you remember we started a mini-sermon series two weeks ago that I titled Rapid Fire Exhortation. And in chapter 5 of Thessalonians, starting in verse 12, that's what we saw. We saw Paul starting firing off these exhortations one after another in a rapid-fire manner. Two weeks ago, when we began this sermon series, uh, we looked at a, a title or a sermon that I titled, God's Expectations for the Church and Her Leaders. God's Expectations for the Church and Her Leaders. That's exactly what we saw in verses 12 and 13. We saw the church's responsibility to her leaders, and then the leader's responsibility to the church. And then last week, as we looked at our second sermon in this series, we looked at those who are stronger in the church and their responsibility to help those who are weaker, those in the church who need help, in a message that I titled, People Got Problems. And in that message, we saw that people inside the church, they, they have problems. They have all kinds of problems. They can be unruly, we looked at. They can have bad behavior. They can be spiritually weak and faint-hearted. And it's the responsibility of the stronger sheep within the flock to help the weaker sheep. So, so far, we've looked at the church's responsibility to her leaders, the leader's responsibility to the church, the stronger sheep's responsibility to the weaker sheep, and now we're going to look at the responsibility that every believer has to God. That's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at the responsibility that you have if you're a believer to God. So, if you found your place and you're physically able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and an errant word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, going through verse 18. Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you now. We are so thankful to be back in your house today. Father God, as we dive into your word this morning, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would speak through me this morning, that you would simply use me as your vessel, as your mouthpiece, that, Father God, that you 
would speak the message that you want heard this morning to your people who have gathered together in your name. So, Father God, right now we give you this time. We love you, we thank you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this message is all about our responsibility as believers, but if you look at the end of that verse, in verse 18, it says, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So I've titled this message, God's Will for Your Life. Preachers and pastors love verses like this, love passages like this, because this one really just sets itself up. This is, this is teed up and just ready to tee off. This has got the sermon title in it, and then there's three verses and there's three teaching points. This is, this is easy this morning. But just because it's easy, I didn't want to take it easy. I want to dive deeper into this text and really look at what Paul's intentions are when he's writing to the Thessalonians. And like I mentioned before, these are not just Paul's exhortations for us, but these are God's expectations of us. And if these are God's expectations of us, then we really should take these seriously. We can see that these are God's expectations of us. We could say that these exhortations are our responsibility to God. Or we could say that these exhortations are, are God's will for our lives. And that's exactly the the language that Paul uses here, and that's what we're going to title the sermon. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. This is the will of God, it says in verse 18. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Has anyone in here ever had a hard time knowing what God's will is for their life? Yeah, we all have, right? Maybe you struggle with knowing what God's will is when you're deciding what job to take, maybe, or what, what house you should buy. Should I buy this house or should I buy that house? Should I, should I move here or should I move there? What is God's will for my life? Or what about, who should I marry? That's a big one, right? What is God's will in my life for who I should marry? There's no doubt that we've all struggled at different times in our lives with knowing what God's will is for our lives. And certainly God has many wills for our lives, but in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16, 17, and 18, Paul lays out three, for sure, that is, things that you can be certain about, that these are God's will for your life if you're a believer this morning. You can know when you leave here that you know these three things this morning are God's will for your life. So let's dive in and look at these. Look with me at verse 16. Verse 16 says, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. That is the shortest verse in the Bible. If you want to memorize a verse this morning, you can memorize 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. You can walk out of here knowing that you memorized a verse of church today. Rejoice always. This is God's first will for your life that we're going to look at. That is to rejoice always or for our sermon. Point number one, be joyful. Be joyful. And if this is an expectation of God, this is more like a, a direct command. Paul is saying, be joyful. This is God's will for your life, is that you rejoice, that you be joyful. And then Paul says, when should we rejoice? When should we rejoice? He answers that question. He says, always rejoice, always. Now, it's important that we put this verse into context, right? Remember that the, that the Thessalonians are suffering severe persecution back in Thessalonica, remember? Put it in context. And Paul was run out of Thessalonica. Remember, he was suffering persecution. And now those same individuals that are still in Thessalonica are now suffering the same persecution that Paul was suffering. The people who were persecuting Paul, they didn't stop with the persecutions, right? Paul's left. Now they've turned their attention. They've turned their focus on the church. And we don't really know exactly how they were persecuted, but what we do know is that it's likely that they were that they were. Um, they were exiled from their community. They were exiled from Thessalonica, right? They were exiled. They were possibly even beaten for their new belief in Jesus Christ. And it's possible that they were even killed. Remember a few weeks ago we were talking about the church was concerned with what happened with those people who were dying before the return of Christ. It's likely that some of these people were killed as martyrs. This is what was happening in Thessalonica, while Paul's writing this letter, they were experiencing severe pain and persecution, yet they were still joyful, and Paul is writing to them saying, rejoice always. No matter what you're going through, you can rejoice. So if this is the case, and this is what they're going through, this is the kind of suffering that they're enduring, how are they supposed to rejoice in the midst of all of this persecution? That's the question that stood out to me as I was studying this. 
Why does Paul expect them to rejoice when they're being beaten, their loved ones are being killed, they're being exiled from their home? And more, as we look at this text, and as we try to apply this text to our lives, as we go through difficult times in our own lives, how are we supposed to rejoice in our own suffering? When we suffer, when we go through difficult times, how are we supposed to do this command that God is commanding us to do and rejoice always? I'm going to tell you this morning, there's only one way that you can rejoice always. There's only one way that you can be joyful always. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. It has to begin with Jesus Christ. It's only through a relationship with him that you will be able to find joy amidst all the difficulties that you're facing in life. This verse is not promising us a joyful life. It's not saying you're going to have a joyful life all the time. It's saying be joyful all the time. No matter what your circumstances are, you can be joyful. You know, interestingly enough, I, I talked about this a second ago, that this is the shortest verse in the Bible. The two shortest verses in the Bible both deal with emotions. The first is this verse dealing with joy. The second shortest verse is John 11, 35, which reads, Jesus wept. There you go. If you want to remember another verse, you want to memorize two verses in church this morning. John 11, 35 reads, Jesus wept. There's your shortest two verses in the Bible. One dealing with joy, and now the other one dealing with sorrow. The two shortest verses in the Bible both deal with emotion. You see, the concept of joy and sorrow are both found in the Bible. And if you've been along or alive longer than 10 minutes, you understand that life is filled with ups and downs. It's filled with joy and with sorrow. It's filled with pleasure and pain. They're both a reality in our lives. And it's okay to feel sorrow. It's okay to to have pain in your life. It's okay to be hurt. This is why Paul wrote to the Romans. In Romans 12, 15, says, Rejoice with those who are rejoicing and weep with those who weep. Because both are realities in all of our lives. But this verse says to rejoice always. So you're asking, how do I harmonize these two verses? How am I supposed to weep with those who weep and then rejoice always like First Thessalonians, or First Thessalonians chapter five says, "How am I supposed to rejoice and weep at the same time?" This morning, I want to give you three different reasons you can rejoice through your suffering. No matter what you're going through this morning, I want to give you three reasons that you can be obedient to First Thessalonians chapter five verse sixteen. Three reasons that you can rejoice this morning no matter what you're going through. No matter what difficult times life has brought to your doorstep, here are three reasons that you can still be joyful. The first reason that you can rejoice or be joyful this morning is found in Romans 8.28. Brandon actually just quoted it in his prayer. I don't know if you picked up on that. It says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Purpose. All things, no matter what life brings you, works together for good. If you're, a, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you're a son of God, everything works together for good. Not some things, not every once in a while something you go through. All things work together for your good if you love Jesus Christ and you are his child. You can rejoice in that fact this morning. You can be joyful that God is a personal God, that you have a relationship with him, and that he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your hurt, he knows your pain, and he knows how deep the cut is. And he's saying you can be joyful because you can know that my Bible says he's going to use this pain, he's going to use this cut for your own personal good and to his glory. Do you see that? That's something to be joyful about. We all go through difficult times in life. Every one of us are going to experience pain and suffering. The only difference is how we're going to respond to that. Some people are going to get angry at God. They're going to shake their fist at God. They're going to question God. While others are going to pray for God's will to be done. Thy will be done, Father. They will, they're going to pray, God, what do you want me to learn from this experience? What do you want me to gain from this? God, what is your will through all of this pain, through all of this suffering? Show me, God. Draw near to me so that I may draw near 
to you. The first person in this scenario focuses on God. There's, there's another person. If you have two people and one says, one's angry at God and one's not angry at God, you can see the difference there. While one person is not going to gain anything out of that experience, one person is going to say, God, why did you let me go through this? God, why did you bring this to my doorstep? Being angry. They're not going to gain anything out of that because they're shaking their fist at God. The second person in the scenario says, God, show me why. Help me to understand your will through this. Draw near to me through this experience. That person can rejoice. That person can find joy no matter what they're going through because their focus is on Jesus Christ, not on themselves. The first reason we can be joyful this morning is because we know, because Scripture tells us that all things work together for our good if we love God and if we're called according to His purpose. If you're a believer, you've been called according to his purpose. You can be joyful in that fact this morning. The second reason you can rejoice this morning is found two verses earlier in Romans 8.26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. If there's a verse you need to highlight in your Bible, it's Romans 8.26. The second reason you can rejoice this morning is no matter what you're going through, if you're a born-again believer, you're not going through it alone. You are not alone. You have God with you. The Holy Spirit, the third person of God, lives within you, and he's going through this trial with you. But not only that, listen to the last part of this, part B or part C of this verse. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Do you know what that means? That means the Holy Spirit prays for you. Do you know how much joy that brings me? Do you know how much peace that brings me to know that God himself is praying for me no matter what I'm going through? When I don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit intercedes Amen. for us. God in the third person prays for you. If you're a believer... If you have a relationship with him, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, he intercedes for you. Now that is a reason that you can rejoice this morning, no matter what you're going through, no matter what life has brought you, you can know and you can rejoice in the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within you and he's interceding to God the Father on your behalf. That's what Romans 8.26 says. The second reason you can rejoice this morning is that God is with you no matter what you're going through. The third reason you can rejoice this morning is found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of the God, Son of God. The first or the third reason you can rejoice this morning is because you have the assurance of eternal life. You have the assurance of eternal life if you're a born again believer. This verse says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know if you're a born again believer, you should take have an underlying joy in your life all the time that nothing should be able to take away because this is not your home. You have a home in heaven. You have eternal life. You're just passing through here. This pain that you're experiencing is only temporary. And the Bible says that one day when you meet Jesus Christ, he's going to wipe every tear away from your eye. He's going to give you a perfect body that you should live with him in eternal glory. You have eternal life, and that's something this morning, I don't care what you're going through, that's something you can rejoice about. I've given you three things that you can rejoice about. No matter what you're going through, all things work together for your good. God is with you during this trial, and you have eternal life if you're a child of God. There's many, many, many more reasons you can rejoice. We obviously don't have time to go through them all this morning, but I want to give you one more. I'll give you a bonus here, right? This is extra free of charge. Another reason you can rejoice this morning is no matter what you're going through, God has given you his written word. And I think sometimes we take that for granted. 
Sometimes we take for granted that we have God's written word probably throughout most of our houses. Many of us probably have two or three or possibly more Bibles in our homes. We probably take it for granted that we can go to God's word anytime we want to and God can speak to us personally. Do you think about that? That when you go to God's word, people say, I want to hear from God. I want God to speak to me. Open your Bible. There's his words. He can speak to you through his word, through his written word. That's something to rejoice about. That no matter what you're going through in life, you can go to his word and God can speak to you. We have his written word. That's point number one. Be joyful. Rejoice always, no matter what you're going through in life. That was verse 16. Let's look at verse 17 as we look at God's second will for your life. Verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. God's second will for your life this morning is to be prayerful. Be prayerful. Again, the expectation or the command here is to pray. How are you supposed to pray? You're supposed to pray without ceasing. The command is pray. How are you supposed to do it? Without ceasing. This means constant, to constantly be praying. And if you've been in church any length of time, you've probably heard this verse before, no doubt. But if this verse is new to you, the idea here is that, you, that you're in prayer throughout the day. Prayer is not just something that you do before dinner or before you go to bed. It's something that you do all throughout the day. You can pray driving down the road. Obviously, you keep your eyes on the road. Don't close your eyes. You can pray at work. You can pray going on a walk, going for a run. doesn't matter where you are. You can be in prayer to God. You can pray, pray anywhere, anytime you want to. I heard a preacher by the name of Brian James. You can look him up, but you're probably going to find him. Bill Brian James. Maybe not so many preachers, Brian James. But I heard this guy preaching about prayer. His name was Brian James. And he was talking about he was talking about the word amen, how we end our prayers with the word amen. And I don't remember exactly what all he said. But the concept that I came away with, we say amen when we finish our prayers, right? What would our life look like? What would our day look like if we got out of bed, started our day with prayer, and didn't say amen? What if we didn't say amen? What if we didn't hang up the phone with God? What if we prayed a little while later, a little more, and we kept that communication line open and we didn't say amen? And then we prayed a little bit more throughout the day and we didn't say amen. And throughout the day, we kept God on the phone. We kept a constant communication with him, speaking to him about our day, our needs, our desires, our wants. And then praising God for who he is. Everything else that incorporates prayer. We're going to look at that in a minute. What happens if we didn't hang up the phone? And then the last thing we did at night. Before we closed our eyes and went to sleep. Is we prayed. And the last thing we said. Was amen. Good night God. I'll talk to you tomorrow God. What if we kept God on the phone all day? What if the communication line was open all day? That is the idea of praying without ceasing. Some of you in here this morning might be thinking, that sounds wonderful, but I have a hard enough time praying maybe once a day, maybe twice a day. And then maybe this morning you don't even really say, you're saying, I don't even really know how to pray. Maybe, maybe that's you. I want to speak to you all for a moment. You know, there's a few different ways that you're commanded to pray. There's, there's different ways. There's different aspects to prayer. And those of you who are struggling in your prayer life, I want to show you an acronym that you can use for prayer. It's pretty catchy. Some of you in here have maybe heard it before. I'm not sure where it came from. I'm not sure how long it's been around. But the acronym is ACTS. A-C-T-S, like the book. Pretty easy to remember, right? The acronym is ACTS. If you're struggling in your prayer life, you can follow this model of prayer, and it will help you in your prayer life. I promise. ACTS. A-C-T-S. We'll start with A. A stands for adoration. A stands for adoration. This means to, to love something deeply, to respect something deeply. This is where we get the word adore. This is how you start your prayer. You start your prayer with adoration, with love, and with respect towards God. An example that you can use is 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11 and 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. It says, Yours. O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. 
O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Did you hear the prayer in that? Did you hear the, the prayerful adoration, the love, and the respect towards God? You see, adoration is, is praising God for who he is, and not only who he is, but what he's done. We sing songs of adoration, but we also see prayerful adoration in the Bible. We see these examples of prayerful adoration in the Bible. We see it from David, and we also see it from the Apostle Paul. Adoration is not thanking God for what he's done for you, right? We're going to talk about thanking God in a moment. We're going to get to that in a minute. Adoration is praising God for who he is. Because he is God. And more, because he deserves our praises because he is God. God is worthy of all of our praises, but not just on Sunday morning. Not just when we sing a four, three or four songs on Sunday morning. He's worthy of our praises our praises every day, all throughout the day. He's worthy of our adoration in our prayers. Start your prayer with praises, with adoration. C is next, confession. C, C stands for confession. After adoration, confess your sins. A lot of people misunderstand what confession really is. A lot of people think that it's just, it's apologizing to God. God, I'm sorry I have sinned. I'm sorry for what I did. You can certainly apologize for your sins, and you should apologize to God for your sins, I believe. But what confession really means is to agree with God. It, it agrees with God. What confession really looks like is saying, yes, God, I agree with you. Your word says that I'm a sinner. The Bible says that these attributes or these things in my life are sins, and I agree with you. Yes, that was wrong. Yes, that was sin. Yes, God, I agree with you. I have sinned against you. And yes, I deserve punishment for my sin because your word says so. I agree with you, God, that my sins separate me from you. That confession. Yes, God, what I just did, I confess to you, I agree with you that that was wrong. You can ask for forgiveness after you've confessed it. You have to confess it first, then you can ask for forgiveness, and then you can ask for God to help you to repent from your sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. I'm going to summarize these verses. But if you're taking notes, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, in summary, say this. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And the truth is not in us. We should confess our sin. Confession is saying we have sinned. It's, it's, it's an agreement with God saying, yes, I have sinned against you. Adoration, confession, now T. The T stands for thanksgiving. Everyone should understand what giving thanks means. Giving thanks to God after opening with adoration, praising God and confessing your sins. Now you move into thanksgiving. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says, Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for all things, always. Thank him for the blessings that he gives you each and every day. Think about everything in, everything that you have in this life, from your, from your health to your family, your friends, your job, financial security. Think about everything that you have to be thankful for. Now think about, you've probably heard this before, now think about what did you thank God for yesterday? Everything that you have to be thankful for, now think about what did you thank God for yesterday, and now think about what you would have woken up this morning with if you only had the things that you thanked him for yesterday. What would you have this morning? All of the things that we have to be thankful for, and our thankfulness is probably pretty limited. We fail to give thanks to God for everything we have always. You know, I bet you could pray without ceasing if you tried to pray to God and thank him for everything you had, because it would probably take you all day to thank him for everything that you have, right? It would certainly take you hours to thank God for everything that he's given you throughout the course of your life. If you woke up tomorrow with the things that you thank him for, to, for today, what would you have to do? Thank God always for every good gift that he gives you. Finally, S. S stands for supplication. Supplication means to ask for. That's what supplication means. 
And we're all probably really good at supplication, but there's a Bible verse I'm going to point out to you. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God wants us to come to him and ask for him to provide for us. Because he is our provider. He is giver. He is sustainer. And he wants us to recognize that. He wants us to recognize who takes care of us. But my guess, again, is, is probably that everyone in here is pretty good at asking for things from God. Right? My guess is that everybody's pretty good at going to God in supplication. We've probably got this part of our prayer life down. God, give me this. God, give me that. I need this. I need that. I want this. I want that. We're probably really good at this part of prayer. But my guess is that we're probably not as good at adoration. My guess is that we're probably not as good at confession or thanksgiving. We probably lack in our prayer life an adoration, confession, and thanksgiving, but we have no problem praying to God about everything we want or everything that we need. Let us start to pray with more adoration, more confession, more thanksgiving. Let that be how we pray without ceasing. And since I gave you a bonus on point number one, I'm going to give you a bonus on point number two. Pray according to God's will. Pray according to God's will. This is obviously not in Acts. Pray according to God's will. And we can look to Jesus for this example. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed, and it's recorded in Matthew 26, 39. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. There's his request. Jesus made a request to the Father. He said, if it is possible, Father, I don't want to go through this. Let this cup pass from me. That's the request Jesus made to the Father. But then look what he said. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. Jesus Christ prayed in accordance with the Father's will. What a great way to close your prayer after adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. What a great way to close your prayer. I ask for these things, Father, but not my will. Will let your will be done in my life. Jesus Christ prayed that way. He prayed, above all else, Father, let your will be done. Let's begin to pray a little less selfishly a little more, Father, let your will be done. A little more adoration. A little more thanksgiving. God's will for our lives is to be joyful. No matter what you're going through, be joyful. The second will is to be prayerful. Look with me now at verse 18 as we look at God's third will for your life this morning. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. You probably can figure out what point number three is. God's third will for your life this morning is that you are thankful. Be thankful. Verse 18 says, In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. Does Paul mean that you need to be thankful for everything in your life? Is he saying that? He's not saying you need to be thankful for every single thing. Certainly there's things in life that you're going to encounter that you're not thankful for. Sickness, death of a loved one, you're not thankful for those things. What does Paul say? He says, in everything, in the midst of everything, during everything that you're going through, give thanks. Give thanks no matter what you're going through. A few weeks ago we talked about how believers can look at death and persecution and all that differently than non-believers, right? We, we talked about that. And believers can look at these things differently because they have hope. Because they have hope in Jesus Christ. The same applies to, to giving thanks. It's easy to give thanks to God when God's just pouring on the blessings. I got a new car. I got a new job. I got this big raise. It's easy to thank, thank God during those times. But how, how quick are we to give God thanks when we, we start going through some stuff? Right? When we start going through persecution, when things, when things in life just aren't going right, when life has dealt me a bad hand right now. How do we respond to God then? Do we, do we still thank God? What about when life goes wrong like it was for the Thessalonians, right? The Thessalonians were going through some stuff back in Thessalonica. They were, they were seeing their loved ones martyred for their faith. 
They were being beaten. They were being exiled. How do we respond to God then? How do we respond to God then? Do we give him thanks then? Or is it just easy to give him thanks when we get everything that we want? No matter what a believer goes through in life, no matter what we go through as believers, we should be able to stop and thank God for the good things he gives us. Now again, I want to give you three reasons you can thank God this morning, no matter what you're going through. No matter what you're going through in life, I want to give you three reasons that you can thank God. And these are over like your health, your job, obvious things, right? The first reason you can thank God in any situation is because God is good. God is good. Psalms 118 actually opens and closes with the same verse. If you've never read Psalm 118, you need to. I encourage you to go read this. Verse 1 and verse 29 read the same. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is good, for his mercy endures forever. The verse, this verse says, we give thanks. Why? We give thanks. It says, give thanks to the Lord. Right? That's our command. That's what we're talking about. Give thanks. Be thankful. This verse says, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Why should we? Because God is good. No matter what you're facing in life, you can rest on this truth that God is good this morning. Amen? Amen. In Genesis 131, the Bible says this. It says, Then God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. In the beginning, God created everything, and everything he made was good. God's desire was to have a, a perfect relationship with man, sinless relationship with man. His desire wasn't for man to be against God or to be apart from God, to be separated from God. Man took it upon himself to do that. God is good no matter what you're facing. Rest in that truth no matter what. The second reason you can thank God in any situation is because he knows you by name. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says, But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Listen to this. I have called you by your name. You are mine. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. This verse is true for every true believer in Christ. God said, I have called you by name. I know your name, and you are mine. Wow, what a truth this morning. God knows my name. Does God know your name? I am nothing. I'm a nobody. But when I pray to the living God, when I start speaking to God, He knows who it is. He knows my name. God who created the heavens and the earth, the sun and the stars and the moon, knows me personally. Does He know you personally? The second reason I can thank God no matter what I'm going through, no matter what garbage life has dealt me, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. God knows me by name. Amen. That deserves more than one amen. amen. He knows my name. I hope he knows your name as well. And because he knows my name, that also must mean that he cares for me and that he loves me as well. And that leads me into the third reason you can be thankful in any situation. The third reason you can thank God no matter what you're going through in life is because he loves you. He loves you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loves us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that I love God first, because I couldn't. Not because I love him, but he loves me that he sent his only son to die as the propitiation, as the atonement for my sins. There is so much good news in that verse. There is so much to be thankful for in this verse. If you're struggling to be thankful to God, you need to write this verse down. 1 John 4, 10, and you can go to this verse anytime and you can remember what you have to be thankful for. Just in this verse, you can be thankful first that God loves you. He, secondly, he loved you even when you didn't love him back. You didn't love God. God loved you. Thirdly, he sent his son for you. 
Because he loves you, he sent his son for you. Fourthly, that his son died in your place. And then fifthly, his death was the propitiation, the atonement, or the payment for your sins. There is five reasons you can thank God just in 1 John 4.10. I thank God today and every day of my life that he loved me and that he sent his son to die for me. I give you a bonus on one and two. I give you four points instead of three. There is no bonus for point number three. Because there is nothing in this world that can top the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing can be added to this point. Nothing can be added to Jesus Christ. Nothing can be said that is more powerful than the love of Jesus Christ. There is nothing in this life I am more thankful for this morning than the love of Jesus Christ, the fact that he died for me. Amen. I thank God today for his love for me. And if you're a born-again Christian this morning, I thank God for his love for you too. Listen to me. If you're going through some stuff, if you're going through some difficult times in life right now, I know. I know life can be difficult. I've heard some of them. I've prayed with you. I know it can be hard. Life is difficult. Life was difficult for the Thessalonians too. But Paul, pray, or Paul, Paul wrote them and he told them to be joyful, to be prayerful, and to be thankful. Because if you're a born-again believer this morning, these should be realities in your life. You should be able to thank God. And you remember at the beginning of the message, I said these are three things that God expects out of believers' life. I said believer because if you're not a believer, you, you don't know what true joy is. You don't know what true thankfulness is. You don't know what true prayer is. They, you cannot know what these are because they, they cannot be present in your life. You cannot experience true joy and true thankfulness and true communion with God because it's only available to true Christians, to those who truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ. People who are not children of God, they may think that they have true joy, true thankfulness, but they, they can't even begin to understand what true joy really even is. It's because it's not available to them. They, they, they might think that they have joy. That, that's why they buy new things one after another. New pair of shoes, new house, new boat, new job, new toys. They just continuously try to fill this emptiness moment after moment, thing after thing, day after day, but nothing in this temporal world can fill that eternity void. Nothing. Each and every person was born with that void in their life, and there is nothing that can fill that void except Jesus Christ. People have been trying to fill it for thousands and thousands of years with money, fame, fortune, fancy new houses, cars. It doesn't matter. Friends, popularity. Nothing will fill that void in your life except for Jesus Christ. Those people get to the end of their lives, and they die with nothing. They die with no joy, no happiness, no peace. And then they die with no eternal life because they have no Jesus Christ in their life. They die with nothing. Nothing. There's only one thing that can that make you live these three verses. There's only one thing in life that can let you rejoice always no matter what you're going through. There's only one thing that can allow you to pray without ceasing. There's only one thing in this life that can give you eternal thanks and, and a thankful heart, a true thankfulness for what God has done for you. And I'm thankful for everything that God has done for me, but the house, the car, the money, it's peanuts in comparison to the eternal life that I have. I hope you have eternal life this morning. I hope that you know him. I hope that you've met him this morning. Is your life filled with joy? Can you rejoice always? Can you be thankful in any situation? Do you pray without ceasing? Because that's what God wants you to do. He says right here at the end of this verse, in closing, this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus for you. It is God's will that you rejoice, that you pray without ceasing, and you thank Him. Does that describe you this morning? I'm my hope and my prayer is that it does. If it does not, come talk to me. Come talk to me this morning. Let's get right. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you now. Lord God, I have so much to 
be thankful for, Father. God, you are king. You are Lord. You are the only one who can forgive sins. You're the only one who can give us eternal life. The Bible says that you are good. You are a good, good father. And Father God, I thank you for that today. I thank you for each and every person who has taken time out of their day to come and hear from you this morning. And my prayer right now is that each and every person has heard not from me this morning, but from you, Father. My prayer is that you use me as your mouthpiece, as your vessel. God. Lord God, there's one more mercy, or there, there's one more miracle to be done in this room. There's another miracle in this room. Father God, have your will, have your way. I pray that as you stir in the lives of your people, I pray that they would respond out of obedience to you. I pray that if anyone in here doesn't know you, if they don't have that true joy, that underlying joy, that underlying peace, that underlying thankfulness, that no matter what we're going through in life, God, I can focus on you. I can say I have eternal life. I've been forgiven of my sins. This is not my home. I'm just passing through. I pray that they can say that. God, if they can, I pray that today is the day of salvation because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. I pray that they would get it right. I pray that we would be serious as we go into the time of invitation. The altar is open, and I pray that we would respond to you, God. I love you. I thank you today that all things work together for my good. I love you, God. And I know in the bottom of my heart, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I've been called according to you.